I've still got the, the screen popped up from when I ran my uh, my demo model before, but the, the one I stole from me though. I'm gonna cancel out of that. I'm actually gonna go back to the beginning here. Close out of these and make sure there isn't anything I need to save. Okay. And again, we may do this. We may do this in more detail. We may do this where we take screenshots or something like that, do a PDF. In fact, that'd be wonderful. But I'm going to go ahead and talk about it on camera right now, just so that everybody knows basically what's going on. Two most important things for you to know on this particular desktop. One is the ZPrint software. ZPrint, and this is right now we're up to version 7.12. We open that up. And this is the program that we are actually going to import our model into. So if somebody brings it up using, you know, if somebody uses a, if some, if you, we've got internet on this machine, so if they do Dropbox, or they email it to themselves, or if they bring a flash drive in, whatever, they bring their file to us, we'll open up their file. And in this case, I've still got Vito up in front of me. What the file type? That's an excellent question. It depends on whether you're doing color or monochrome. If you're doing monochrome, just about any 3D file type will work. Um, 3D DXF, 3DS, 3D Studio files. You can't open a Rhino file directly. It doesn't support that file type, but you can convert it into a 3DS or an STL or anything like that. If you're planning on doing a color model, it needs to be a VRML file. I think I've, I, that file type is alternately re referred to as VRML or WRML, which, as I understand it, that file type is basically just the modern, grown-up version of STL. I mean, it's like STL, except it, it understands things like color encoding. And we should probably we should probably talk about this in more detail, but it's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. When you're doing color, like if you're working in Rhino or whatever. You want to make sure, this is a mistake that a lot of people make, you want to make sure that you don't have a layer color assigned. You want to make sure it's an actual object property. You want to make sure either object has your color or your pattern or whatever on it. A lot of people get layer colors set up the way they want and they're like, well, where's my color? Why is it coming through? I'm like, well, did you assign that as a layer property or an object property? And sometimes they have to go back to their source Rhino file and export another version of it. Theoretically, yo, go ahead. Uh, VRML file, is that all available through Rhino? Yes, okay. yes. 3DS and STL and VRML are all things that you should see. I can't remember whether that's in the export or the save as menu. I'm wanting to say in Rhino, all I'll of those are under the export. Excellent, excellent. Since we're talking about Rhino, you know how you got the option to export either with or without the origin? So you don't want to include the origin. Because what will happen if you export with the origin sometimes is you'll get a bounding rectangle that has your object and then this huge box that reaches out and grabs your origin. And one of the one of the annoying things about this software is that it is primitive enough that it'll see that bounding rectangle and it'll go, I've got an object too big to fit in the build tray. And there's no good way to break that bounding rectangle apart and go, no, I just want this object. So. If you've got encoding or weird grouping or anything like that, and you want to ungroup stuff and you want to remove that, you want to make sure you don't export it with any of that, you want to make sure you don't export it with the origin. And periodically people have to go back to their source file and do it again. I'm actually getting very close to replacing these workstations here. I'm going to try to make sure that the ones that I replace these with in a few days are going to be set up exactly like the ones we've got right now, so there shouldn't be there shouldn't be a jarring transition for you, but just know that I'm about to replace these boxes and the ones that I'm bringing in are going to have Rhino 5 set up and working on them, so that's going to make your lives a little bit simpler. But yeah, those are those are your basic file types you can use. The ones I see most commonly are 3D DXF, 3DS, STL, and anytime anybody's doing color, the VRML. Or WRML. I think they're I think they it goes by both things. And Vitos, I think, was Vito actually had saved his file as a CVD file, which is a part file for the ZPrint software. 
That's another file type that'll accept. You can save, you can get all your stuff into your, your zprint file, and then if you want to, you can save the zprint file. And if you've got a whole bunch of stuff that you've aligned carefully and scaled carefully, sometimes that's not a bad idea to do. I've sort of passed some copies of the uh, zprint software around to some folks who are going to be working with this to evaluate it. And uh, it can be really helpful for doing things like estimates and figuring out scale. because I'm going I'm to stick with the same model. This is, this is Mito's original file, and as you can see, this thing is huge. And there are going to be times when you have to deal with scale. I'm going to shrink this down deliberately. I'm going to make it way smaller than it was. And if I go into my transform menu, if I select my object, I go into my transform menu and pick scale, then I've got the, the, a, pretty, a pretty standard dialog here where I can either do a proportional resize by axis or I can do a, a, an absolute or relative percentage scale. It's worth mentioning at this point, some of you guys may already know this, the build tray in this machine is 8 by 8 by 10, basically. 8 inches, 10 inches wide, 8 inches deep, and 8 inches tall, 8 by 8 by 10. Um, if possible, you want to keep your stuff slightly smaller than that. I always find that I get better results and better prints if I have a little bit of margin around the edges of my object. But most of the time, most people's stuff is going to be way smaller than that. If I were bringing different files in here, it would automatically align them in here so that they all fit inside this rectangle here. I'm going to shrink this sucker down considerably. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to take my large stack this time. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it an inch. I believe is what I did last time. And you can see if I fly over, it's just hanging out in the middle of the build area. If I go back to transform, my first option is align parts and build. And if I do that, it's just automatically going to drop this in the corner here. What did you do to put that? Oh, my God. under transform, align parts and build. It's sort of very, very primitive nesting software. It's, what it does is it takes, the, it takes the rectangular bounding box around your object and it will butt those up against each other. You know, if I have you know, a C-shaped thing, it's not smart enough to go, hey, I can stick something skinny in between the legs of that. Not quite sophisticated enough to do that. It just it puts a box around everything and then it butts the boxes to one another. All right, if I decide that I didn't like the position where it automatically aligns this, I have the option to manually drag in it over to the center, which is what I did last time. Is uh, is it is it better to if you say you have like two or three parts to just put them in a row, or is it faster to like see if you can try to place them so that they're all in one map? What? That's an interesting question. In terms of like in terms of like strength or integrity, it doesn't matter how you arrange them with regards to each other. But in terms of speed, basically the the main limiting factor in terms of how fast a job is going to run. Is how much Z exactly? How much Z there is, and that's that's probably similar to some other things. That's actually that's actually similar to principles like on the laser cutters. Like on the laser cutters, the more wide you have, the longer it's going to take to run. Similar thing here. The, 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 the more height you've got in your build tray, the more overall passes it's going to have to make. And so the longer it's going to take you there. Oftentimes you're not going to get a choice, but when you do have a choice, if you want to optimize it to run as fast as possible, then yeah, you want to keep it as flat as possible and. To, avoid it getting taller than it needs to be. The Align software that it's got here is clever enough that it mostly tries to do that. It tries to spread things out before it goes up. But yeah, if you ever end up manually tweaking your alignment or manually doing it before you bring it in, yeah, it's good to know that the less Z you have, the faster it's going to run. All right. Um, like if I have a, a tray full of parts, it is going to take a tiny bit longer per pass than if I'm only doing one part, but it's going to take a lot longer for additional passes in the That makes total sense, right? It's probably also worth mentioning that like, if I've got a long, skinny part, your strength of your model is a little bit dependent on your orientation. Because if you think about it, it's building a bunch of horizontal layers like this. So if I have some long, pencil-thin thing, not only is it going to take me a super long time if I print it standing up, but because all of my seams are going to be perpendicular to it, it's going to be quite fragile if I print it upright. The closer to flat I get it, the, uh, the stronger it's going to be because I'm going to have layers running the length of my object. Is everybody in 
envisioning that okay? Am I explaining it? Okay. Yeah, that's that's immediately intuitive to some people, and some people kind of scratch their heads and look at me, so I wanted to make sure. So yeah, with, to a certain extent, the orientation of your object does determine how strong it is, and it definitely determines how long it's going to take to run. The nice thing is, if you've got it optimized to run quickly, you've probably got it oriented in the strongest direction. In this case, with something like this, I could probably turn it any which way, and it's not going to make a huge difference. But as you can see, it automatically oriented it so that the broadest, flattest face of its bounding rectangle was laid out horizontally. So it'll do that for you. It's smart enough to know that's the best idea. Because Camino did this as a BRML file, the, uh, you can see the color actually came through. I'm going to fly in a little bit. And you can, you can use your flyover to really get in here and look at all of your little details. And there are going to be times when that's necessary. I don't have a problematic file on hand right now, and we might look at that later so that we can do screenshots, but if I've got a model where there's anything wrong with the geometry, anything where the Zprint software thinks it's not going to be able to handle it, it'll turn part or all of that model this very distinctive dark charcoal gray. So if you've got a model where it's like everything looks good except this one chunk is this dark gray that I don't recognize, what that means is Zprint thinks there's something about the model that it's not going to be able to print properly. It won't always give you a helpful cue telling you what. It might be inverted normals, it might be an open face somewhere, it might be that it just thinks your walls are too thin. But it means that where, whatever region it turns that color in your preview screen here, it's like, uh-oh, I better go back and look at this and see if I can figure out what's going on. So it, does, it, it, it doesn't diagnose with any great sophistication, but it will let you know, hey, this region of your model's got something wrong, you better look at it. That's a super helpful thing to do. As we sort of spread uh, uh, this software around and let everybody know what's going on with this stuff, it's getting to the point where everybody's able to kind of look at their files beforehand and work out scale issues to find problematic geometry. But you're going to find people who come in and they're like, oh, what's going on? You're going to have that conversation with them. If you see that dark gray and they don't have any dark gray in their model, there's problematic geometry. And it's back to the drawing board for a minute. All right, this one is in good shape, though. I'm going to fly back out here. Is there a, a certain distance that we're not supposed to go under? Like as far as like the thinnest, like as a rule of thumb, of an inch as a rule like of thumb, I've been eight. saying like eighth of an inch. Eight yeah, an inch. eighth of an inch is usually if you go much thinner than that. And again, it depends on the size and shape of your model a little bit. But as just a general rule to give people a guideline, if you start making like you know spires or parts that stick out or walls much thinner than about an eighth of an inch you're going to start having problems with it. It's going to start becoming so fragile that it's going to be difficult to excavate without crunching it. Not always impossible, but difficult. So that eighth inch rule is one that I like to float out to people. It's just sort of a jumping off point. Excellent question. Excellent question. At your own experience, you may you may come up with a more, a more sophisticated answer that's slightly different than mine. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. You guys, I'm not even going to lie, you guys are all way sharper at 3D modeling than I am, so there's going to be a little bit of a dialogue between us. All right. Back to, back to our model. Ah, we've got our three colored axes indicating X, Y, and Z, and just so we are all on the same page here. Let me get this on in correctly. There we go. This corner right here represents the, the origin of your of your three axes is going to be it's going to correspond in real life to the bottom corner over here on your front left side so if this thing had traveled down you know your this corner right here is going to be down in the bill tray toward the front on your left side that's the orientation that was probably already obvious to some of you guys but I wanted to go ahead and say it because when you're in flyover and you're trying to figure out where am I going to hit loose powder and where am I going to run into a model, remembering those landmarks can be super, super helpful. So like right now, with this corner face in front, this is the actual orientation that's going to be in over here. Now if I'd gotten this thing in and I was happy with my scale, I'm like this is actually what I want it to look like, this is the size, this is the color, and I'm ready to go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go under File, 
and there's an option under file that says 3D print time estimator. I'm going to click on that, and it's going to generate this little report for me right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all the text of this report and copy it, and I'm going to go over here to my C printer shortcut folder. And I've got a file in here. I'm actually working on a couple of different versions, but the one we care about right now. Uh, you got get there, though. One second. Colleague paging me on radio. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Alright, talking to my Okay. Alright, I'm gonna go to my 3D print invoice. I've just got an Excel spreadsheet in here called 3D print invoice. Forgive me, I gotta eavesdrop on this and make sure it doesn't concern me. 